Thanks for coming. Well, this is the uh, the sixth session for WinfoSec. Uh, WinfoSec is Hackforge's information security subgroup. So um, thanks for thanks for coming, and taking a look. So uh, we're uh, go. What we'll go through today is a little bit of an introduction on uh, what uh, this particular part of OWASP is. Um, this is the, the, like I mentioned, the sixth one. We've done five other sessions on OWASP, uh, the OWASP top 10. And uh, so if you're interested in the others, you can go to YouTube and take a look at those, the Hackforge um, uh, 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 channel on YouTube. Um, so we'll take a look at, we'll introduce what the concept is for this particular one. We'll take a look at CVEs in general, uh, problems with CVEs. We'll do some remediation live with a application called Chatsploit. Um, Chatsploit's the a, a poorly written uh, application, sample application. Uh, it's like a chat application uh, that has a whole bunch of security vulnerabilities in it. We look at it every month um, to see all the bad things that uh, all the things that are wrong with Chatsploit and then try and fix those problems. Um, so in the in the first talk we did on SQL injection, we showed a uh, a live SQL injection exploit in the app, and then how we actually remediated that um, that vulnerability. Um, great. We'll also take a look at notable CVEs, ones that might ruin your weekend, at least ruin Christmas for me one year, um, and then uh, some critics on the CVE program, and so. Uh, uh, okay, this is not insecure design. This is whatever vul uh, vulnerable and outdated components. I've got to update this side. Vulnerable and outdated components. So this is yeah, <laughs> yeah on on the fly. All right, I'm really prepared. Um, so uh, this is number six. This is the OWASP top ten. Um, what is the OWASP top ten? If you're not familiar with it, if this is your first session, it's a uh, a set of ten common um, security problems at the application level. So information security is a big topic. OWASP deals with application security. Uh, OWASP stands for the Open Web Application Security Project. Um, so the it's just the application layer. Uh, so there's much more to security than these things, but uh, for, in terms of application security, every every few years they come up with what they think are the most serious um, uh, set of security issues, and then they put it as in the top ten in order to try and communicate this with developers. Right? It's easier to understand ten things. Otherwise, application security um, seems like a really big subject that's hard to tackle. What's interesting, though, is um, over time, these categories seem to get bigger and bigger and bigger. So uh, it's, uh, they're starting you know, like, uh, to throw everything into all these categories. And so it's let, it becoming more, di you know, more difficult to use as a communication mechanism, a direct communication mechanism. Um, for, like, for example, like uh, uh, cross-site scripting uh, used to be number seven. They actually put that, they merged that with, with injection in 2021 because it's a kind of injection, it's a client-side injection. Um, uh, but in doing that, um, the, you kind of, now injection becomes a bigger subject and there's more to cover. Um, I guess, so uh, there's a trade-off, right? but that, uh, that was the original purpose of the top 10 and, that, and that's sort of where it's evolving to try and become more encompassing. All right, so uh, in terms of this one, number six, um, what is that about? So the application is as secure as its uh, weakest dependency. So when you build an application, you, you often include other libraries or frameworks when you're building it. Um, so, uh, you know, so uh, you don't, you probably can't build everything yourself. Uh, and in some cases, you shouldn't build everything yourself, like a, like a cryptographic library. Um, and so you import those because they have a lot of time and effort already built into it. So you don't have to rewrite all of that yourself. Um, and so 
what happens if there's a vulnerability in the library you import? That's what this is about, managing those vulnerabilities. So someone goes and realizes there's an issue with library X, um, CVEs, so a way to get notified on those vulnerabilities and manage those vulnerabilities, and then you go and get, and then you go and remediate. Um, so you patch your dependencies as vulnerabilities are discovered. So there's a few problems with this. The first one is the, the discovery problems, the problem. So new CVEs are created all the time uh, on a daily basis. There were, I think, I think 25,000 or so CVEs created last year. Um, that's a lot per day. Um, you can't know about every CVE. Um, uh, that would be a lot. So what you tend to have to do is go and uh, if, you're, uh, if you're doing this manually, you tend to have to go and subscribe to all of the um, uh, release notes and updates on your, of all your dependencies and all your dependence dependencies uh, in order to get a notification that, okay, you have a vulnerability. So if you have a lot of dependencies, which applications do nowadays, that's a huge amount of work. The question is, so how do you do that automatically in a way that's manu uh, manageable? Um, have something else tell you if, uh, if you happen to get a vulnerability. So that's one problem. So uh, the second problem is vulnerabilities. It's not just the ones you directly inherit, but the ones that they take advantage of. So if you bring in a library, they might bring in other libraries, and then those libraries bring in other libraries. Uh, certain ecosystems are particularly bad with this, like JavaScript. Um, and so uh, it's a hierarchy. If there's a vulnerability in any of those libraries down the way, um, it's, it's a problem. Um, and then uh, a third problem is, okay, so if you, if you know there's a vulnerability and you try and patch it, um, uh, can, you, do you, can you, do you risk breaking your application? Uh, this is particularly the case if you're running maybe libraries that are out of date. Um, not the latest and greatest. So how, how can you be sure that your application doesn't get broken when you uh, patch? Um, some things to help with that. So you probably should do automated scanning. It's too much for some, one person to do. And so you should set that up with some kind of service. So at the place where I work, we built security software. Um, we have an application that does this called White Source hooks up to our repository, it's inside uh, GitHub, and every time we commit code, it scans it to see if we have any new dependencies, and if we have a new dependency, it goes to look up any, to see if there's any CVEs associated with it. Um, so that's all done automatically for us, and then we get a report, and actually we're not allowed to check in the code if there's any new CVEs. So we have to re re resolve that. So that's one way, right? The, the, the vulnerability discovery um, uh, problem, can, you, can, you can help mitigate it with that. The second thing you can do is keep current with well-supported libraries. Um, this one's a little bit harder so because you do have to have some knowledge when stuff becomes end of life. Uh, I haven't seen a lot of automation in this area. Sometimes you'll just be notified of a CVE and realize that you are on a version that has been end of life. And so now you have to get to the new version and that new version may not be compatible with your old one. So that's a little bit of a problem. So yeah, th this takes a little bit of diligence. Um, if you have a library, um, it, well, for your major libraries, uh, the ones that could potentially break your app, uh, you try to keep, uh, keep up with the, with the, uh, supported, maintained versions. Um, and then the third thing is, okay, so if you patch, the, the question was, okay, so if I patch something, has my application broken, right? And I'm probably doing this in a rush because sometimes vulnerabilities are a big emergency. Um, and so how do I know I haven't broken my application? Well, the, the answer to that is uh, a good suite of automated testing. There's no that can provide you some assurance. So you use your CI, CD pipeline. Um, uh, for anyone who's not a developer on the line, you know, so when you check in some code, uh, there's, a whole, there's, a library, there's a suite of uh, tests that you've written 
um, CAI and CD will go and uh, run those tests against the code and tell you if anything has broken. So you, what you do is you check in, oh, I've updated this, this dependency, and it goes, runs through everything and makes sure you haven't what's called regressed. Um, nothing's broken. All right. So in that, that's like, so you would do that anyway, even if it wasn't a security issue, you would do that, otherwise you're pulling your hair out in the software development process. Um, but that is one way where good software development processes actually help security as well. So if you're in an organization that's maybe not doing this, they do exist, um, you can also use uh, security as a, as a potential benefit to maybe encourage people to test. Um, okay, so let's fix some vulnerabilities. So in Chatsploit, um, over here, um, okay, so I have uploaded the code for Chatsploit. You guys can download this if you like. Um, and I, like I mentioned, there's a whole bunch of videos, so you can go and you know, run the exploits yourself and that kind of thing. So it's a JavaScript application, it's a Node application. Um, and so here it is. Um, so the, uh, what I did was, remember, we need a tool to go and discover the CVEs. Otherwise, it's really hard to keep on top of things. And so GitHub, this free tool, it's nice. GitHub has one that's, uh, that you can uh, enable and is free and does it for you. It's called Dependabot, right? So depend, I enabled Dependabot um, in, the, in the repository settings. Uh, before the session, and it found uh, four CVEs. So, like prototype pollution in JSON 5 via the parse method. Okay, all right. So, it says, okay, so um, this is, it tells you what the vulnerability is. So, the parse method uh, before and including 221 does not restrict parsing of keys named proto, which kind of sounds like Greek, but if you know a little bit about uh, JavaScript programming, you might realize, realize why that might be a problem. JSON 5, by the way, is like a, is JSON, but with comments, and uh, you don't have to put quotes around your keys. It's like more, more easier to use JSON. Um, but what lots of people do to process JSON 5 is say, make this JavaScript, uh, because it's very JavaScript-like, and then extract the uh, JSON out of it. But if you make it too much like JavaScript, then it can execute code instead of just parsing the object. That's effectively what it does here with Proto. Um, and so Pratt strings pollute the resulting objects, and, and the impact is, you know, if you're using JSON 5, maybe client-side, there's cross-site cross scripting vulnerabilities. Uh, depending on where you use it, there's an elevation of privilege and so on, and it gives you lots of information here on what this works. The reason they give you so much information is so that you can decide if it affects you. Um, there's sort of two ways to close a, a vulnerability, is one, you fix it. Uh, that ten, tends to be where we err at work, is even if it's not going to affect us, we try to close it. Uh, we try and update anyway. Um, because maybe there's a few reasons you do that. Maybe you're just not creative enough to figure out how it might affect you. Um, and so maybe, oh, and maybe if you ignore it, then uh, it's people use, use the dependency uh, in some other part of the product in the future. And all of a sudden, it becomes from not being able to be exploitable to being exploitable over time. But then you've ignored it. Right? So you've added an exception. So you try and fix it. But if you can't fix it, then you might want to know, like maybe, maybe it breaks your app. You try and fix it, and then your CI CD said, okay, like you're failing on 80% of your tests. So okay, so I can't fix this. Um, so now uh, what do I do? I, you, know, you go back and, and you see, okay, so where, where uh, am I using this? Does this apply to me? If it doesn't, if it does apply to me, maybe it's just in one spot, and I can add a mitigation measure in the code, so it doesn't apply to me. Anyway, that's why they give you all this information about it. Um, so you can do that kind of thing. Nice thing is here, you can create a. Uh, in this case, sure, why not? Uh, JSON five. It's just JSON parsing. How how different can it be? Um, 
So we're going to create a uh, nice little thing here. It provides for you. So it'll actually go and build a, uh, a PR pull request. It's like an update to the software. It'll build a PR for you automatically. And you just have to apply the PR. It's kind of nice. Um, so it's doing that in the background. Um, it takes a little bit of time because it's a uh, JSON uh, update. So it's a, well, a, uh, an NPM update, which means it has to update the version and then run, run the NPM uh, uh, dependency resolution to see what other things inside it got updated. Anyway, so we'll let, we'll let that run for a little bit. All right. Um, I also got one, I did one already in the background yesterday. Because I know sometimes they take a little while to actually create. Okay, there it is. It's already finished off. So we'll just look at this one. So you don't have to learn about the other next one. Okay, and so you can see, okay, so what files did it change? Well, it failed, changed, uh, oh, just the package.lock. Okay, so inside, inside the JSON 5 dependency, I'm surprised it did this. Um, and then the yard not, yarn dot lock, it, um, it, it, it switched from 1.01 to 1, uh, 1.0.2. Uh, and then there's a whole bunch of things here. These are hashes. Um, uh, okay, and so that's great. So that's what it updated. Um, I was actually expecting it to also update a, a high level dependency inside the package.json uh, but this must mean that it's actually updating a sub dependency what does that mean okay so if uh if we go in here and get, try and tell this to go away uh i'll just do this so if we go in here uh the dependencies are inside package.lock but it's also inside package uh, package is, uh, package is like the uh, the high level dependencies, and then package.lock contains a whole bunch of your dependencies. Dependencies, um, and so uh, you can see JSON five is actually not used here. Uh, that's why I didn't update this one. So it actually uh, inside package.lock it updated a sub dependency of one of my original dependencies. Um, anyway, it's great that it allows you to do that. Uh, it's a little bit. The, the choice there to update the dependency of one of your dependencies is a little bit riskier because, well, it has risks um, because the, uh, your dependency probably has a whole bunch of tests and they haven't run your dependence, uh, they haven't run those tests against the updated dependency. Again, CI CD takes, helps you get a little bit of assurance there. All right. Um, uh, let's talk a little bit about what CVEs are. Uh, a little bit of background there. So, does this actually tell me one? Tell me what CVE it is. Uh, okay, there it is. There's a CVE ID. So, uh, all of these, all of these vulnerabilities, these publicly disclosed vulnerabilities. You get a CVE number. So this, that one for JSON 5 was CVE 2022-46175. And so you can go and search for it. And then NIST, the National Institute for Standards and Technology, has a national vulnerability database, NVD, um, which has all of the vulnerabilities. It's like a government program of the US government. Um, and so you can go here and see see what this is all about and you can see that there's a whole bunch of um you know there's like a description and then also like a vector and the vector here is so you know what the what the base score is so it, it considers that a high severity vulnerability um uh we'll talk about what the the like the attack vector av colon n means it's a, the attack vector is potentially via the network. Not always, I don't think, for JSON 5, but it could be attack complexity is low. It is, yeah, it's really low putting inside the JSON, like underscore, underscore proto. Privileges required, low user interaction, none, unchanged, high, and so forth, right? So you've got those severity and metrics there. Um, 
And so uh, this is kind of nice. It's a it's a it's a standard way of uh, classifying vulnerabilities uh, across applications. And so you'll often see like a security department. If you work in an organization, they'll have um, they'll have SLAs around. Okay, so if it's a critical vulnerability, which is nine and higher, if it's critical vulnerability, then our SLA is to patch it within. X days. If it's a high vulnerability, then our SLA is to patch it within Y days, and so on. Um, it allows security organizations to sort of set policy. All right, so we fixed some vulnerabilities. Okay, so are we done? So let's say we went through those full vulnerabilities in our, our repository. Are we, is, are we done fixing CVEs in our application? Um, Think about what we talked about. Well, what we talked about last month, right? You remember what we talked about last month? Putting you on the spot. I'm sorry. You're the only one here from last month. So. <laughs> yeah. So last month was number five. Number five was security misconfiguration, and what we did was um, we primarily we looked at. So let's go to the OWASP website. And so go to OS.10. And if we look at security misconfiguration, there's actually a sub problem. The software is up, out of date, or vulnerable. What software? Well, this was all about infrastructure, the stuff sitting around our application. So not our code was vulnerable, but the operating system was vulnerable, or the database is vulnerable, or the firewall you're using is vulnerable, or the cloud infrastructure you were touching has a vulnerability. And so all of those things, um, you have to still worry about the CVEs of all the, the, all the other dependent environments that you deal with. So these security software that we build for database security, it will go and scan all your databases for CVEs, right? So you got to watch out for, um, for your infrastructure as well as your application. Uh, sometimes they, uh, in your organization, like this will be job segregated. So the application developers just have to worry about the application, the dependency vulnerabilities. Um, and then the DBAs have to care about the CVEs on the database. And um, the operating system administrators have to care about the CVEs at the OS level. Um, and network administrators have to worry about the firewalls. Um, and all that kind of thing. So uh, maybe maybe it's split up, and maybe you're a small shop, and it's not split up, and it's just you. You have to worry about all the infrastructure. So the answer was we are not done. Um, and so uh, I just wanted to show you. Uh, remember CVEs that had all those like those uh, scores? Um, there's actually a CVE calculator, so you can go and so if you. If someone opens up a, um, a vulnerability against you, um, they will ask you, okay, so what's the severity? You can go here, like against your product. You can say, okay, so what's the attack? Let's create the worst possible CV you could get, right? So it's a network one, right? So if it was adjacent network or local or physical, physical, you have to be like at the keyboard of the computer, right? Um, that's the... Uh, the, in terms of severity, it goes down like that. So network's the worst. Uh, attack complexity, how hard is it to, um, uh, to exploit the vulnerability? Uh, like, you don't need a lot of knowledge, so low. Uh, privileges required, that is, you have to be authenticated and have privileges in the, the system before you can exploit the vulnerability. If it's like an operating system vulnerability where, I don't know, it's a vulnerability against Bash, um, the, the or like the Windows shell, um, then you you have to be authenticated before you can get to the shell, right? So there would be be higher. But let's say it's none uh, user interaction. Maybe you don't need any user. Act, you, the user doesn't have to click on something for it to happen, right? The user they just it's like a drive by. They just visit the website. None. Um, uh, the scope so. Uh, and I think unchanged is the, is the worst here. Confidentiality impact is high, high, high. So, okay, maybe. Okay, there you go. Now, then now we've got a 10. So we've got 
this is the uh, this is your your CVE score. The, the absolute worst CVE you could have is is this particular one. It gives you that score, um, and you know maybe confidentiality impact is none, and integrity is none. Okay, so now it's eight point six. Yeah, so that's uh, that's kind of how it works. Um, uh, so did I understand that um, calculator right? Is it is it cap at ten? But there's there cap mul multiple combinations that could result in a yes, okay. yes, that's right. Um, that that could result in a ten. Yeah. So like over here, we have no no availability impact, but we do have a confidentiality uh, uh, impact and an integrity impact. This is, by the way, this is the CIA of security. Um, uh, anyway, so that's, if, it doesn't matter what the availability impact is, it's still gonna be a 10. Yeah. Um, do you, know, you guys know the difference between uh, confidentiality and integrity? Okay, so the CIA, this is like the, like the, tr the, the um, uh, it's a fundamental concept in applications, in uh, information security. So confidentiality is what we probably think about is people stealing information, right? So you have sensitive information, a bank account number, a credit card number, social insurance number, email address, right? They steal that information. That's a confidentiality risk. You have sensitive information and then they steal it. Um, a, then an integrity risk is somebody changes something. So they go into your bank account and they make a modification and says, uh, you know, to give you no money and put the money in this other account. So that's a conf that's a data integrity risk. And an availability risk is you bring down the application. So denial of service attacks. Um, so uh, that's a problem with the application going down and so you can't access the application. Okay, so that's the, um, that is, that's the CIA. There's a bunch of other uh, items here, but they sort of like they they modify the base score. Um, so uh, yeah, I don't know, but we won't go into that. Um, good. Anyway, so that's a CVSS calculator. All right. Um, what's the time? So okay, seven thirty-six. Good. So I don't. There's, there's a little bit of like. Uh, um, Practical stuff in this prison in this presentation, like when we went to the repo and we actually uh, updated the vulnerabilities, but a little bit less. It's more of a theoretical one, like the, the today, like it was last week. I think next week we'll do some stuff with the uh, yeah identification authentication failures. We'll actually do stuff with the application and we'll show an identification identification authentication failure. So uh, a little bit of um, uh, theory. These 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 two uh, these two sessions but okay I just want to talk a little bit about incentives and CVEs so CVEs great system right so the great uh, it it it, um, it categorizes our vulnerabilities um, it uh, it allows people to communicate what a vulnerability is um, is a big database so if someone gives you a CVE number you can go read up on it um, that's great uh, what happens sort of in the industry is that there's a whole bunch of people that want to get CVEs under their names, um, like uh, uh, security researchers or a security a data, da a data or information security organize, uh, company that wants to make a name for themselves. Um, and so they might open a whole bunch of frivolous vulnerabilities in order to try and get one and so if you're a maintainer of a application especially if it's an open source application you might get a whole bunch of these things open against you if it's popular that don't apply to you and this kind of thing happened with CSERF so CSERF is actually part of the was part of the express um, project so this is JavaScript project for an application server application server infrastructure for node um, if you go to de down to CSERF, it's a deprecated. NPM module, module is currently deprecated to a large influx of security vulnerability reports received, most which are simply exploiting the underlying limitation of CSRF itself. ExpressJS project has, doesn't have the resources to maintain it, 
It's l and they feel like it's for an SP for SPA applications, which most JavaScript applications are. Um, it's largely unnecessary. There's an argument to be made that it, maybe it is necessary. It depends on a little bit on your circumstances. And so if you really need this, go bother someone else, basically. It tells you to go to NPM and just search for CSRF. Okay, go use whatever there you <laughs> whatever this is, right? Um, we, we don't want to be we don't want to deal with it anymore, which kind of makes sense. I mean, Express is an application server. Um, the CSS, CSRF uh, functionality inside it's like secondary. Um, and so but and the, a big expense, this is a this is a relatively small project. But a big expense of the um, uh, of of, uh, of the application was just dealing with security reports that were frivolous. So that's one problem, right? People trying to make names for themselves. Um, another problem is uh, the automated scanning isn't perfect. <laughs> so. We, here we have curl. So uh, curl is um, uh, a command line application that you use to interact with a website. So if you want to go and download a, a website from the command line instead of using your browser, you can use curl. Um, same thing with like files, if you want to download a file. Um, I wonder if we can... Uh, if we go curl. Okay, see, so this is the H, so I, I, I used curl and I downloaded the HTTP uh, data for, for the website that I, I showed you before, the curl website, all right. So that's what curl is, um, and curl is actually part of Windows, so I'm running Windows here. Um, uh, there's actually a Windows curl version. version. Okay, everyone has a different version flag. All right, so just making sure you guys can see it. Okay, good. So everyone, this is the Windows curl. It, it's inside, um, okay, which? No, okay, it's Windows. Anyway, this curl's in Windows System 32. Um, over here, uh, in the System 32 directory. So it's, it's a operating system-based curl. Interestingly, so you go and you go and you read up on this. It's shipped as part of Windows. Uh, they don't use curl internally. The Microsoft internals don't, um, but they uh, they they do put it inside System Thirty Two and security scanners. So lots of Windows users everywhere run the security scanners. At some point after December twenty first, twenty twenty two, some of the scanners detected installations of curl in their Windows environment and said, oh, you're, you're out of date. Even though no one really uses curl on Windows, you're out of date and curl has a vulnerability, so you should update it. And so everyone panics. And so the operating system administrators panic. And then a whole bunch of people actually decided to delete curl, which is actually fine. Curl actually isn't really used much. Um, but in deleting curl, uh, Windows update will fail to update because now system 32 has been corrupted. So you have to like restore curl, but it's only at that specific version of curl that, that you have to restore it at. Um, so anyway, so there's, um, there's a problem with scanners. You can't just like, so a scanner tells you, it tells you a vulnerabilities occurred. Um, you can't just blindly follow the advice of the scanner. You have to think about it, which uh, this feels like grunt work. But um, it takes like the senior people in our org to actually handle vulnerabilities appropriately. You have to have like a lot of knowledge and context, even though it's the stuff that like, we, we have to do it. Uh, we have to do it every second week, um, make sure our CVEs are all closed. And um, uh, because of that, like, it, 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 but it's, it's, it's actually hard. It's hard. Anyway. Um, <laughs> uh, and so, okay, so that's, that's my little chat on incentives. Um, one incentive is like those scanners, those scanners want to prove that they're valuable and in, so they will, they will, they're also incented to tell you that you're under attack all the time. Um, so I, I built security software for a living. Um, and there, uh, I can, uh, I, you know, I, I'd like to say that we're, 
uh, we're above this in some way. But uh, a big part of selling security software is, to, you know, is fear. <laughs> um, we, we, we try and provide a, a good product and that kind of thing, but uh, it's definitely in the industry is to try and make people scared enough to buy the product. One way you can make them scared is inside your POC is you say, okay, run this vulnerability scanner and say, oh my goodness, you have um, 80 criticals, critical severity CVEs opened up against your operating system, right? So you better go fix those, but and to make sure it doesn't happen again by the software, right? Um, we don't. I'm sure we don't. I'm not in sales. I'm just in. I'm just in uh, uh, software development. Okay. All right. So infamous vulnerabilities. Um, so there's a few times where like there's a critical event that sort of affects uh, everybody. Um, uh, and I, so I'm wondering if you guys have heard of, heard about these. How, how, Heartbleed, you guys, you, you probably, yes. So Doug has heard about Heartbleed. Um, what, about, uh, what about you, Sherry? Sherry's on, online. See if she's still paying attention. Yep, okay, did you hear, did you, did you hear about Heartbleed, Heartbleed? Back when it came out in, what was it? 2012, yeah. man, we're old. Holy cap! Twit like Do you remember Code Red? eleven years ago. Code Red was like twenty oh three. No, okay, that was before my time. <laughs> okay, all right, good, all right. How about you two? Yes. Okay. So yeah, so this is um, was a vulnerability in OpenSSL. Um, an OpenSSL uh, basically runs the uh, whenever you see a lock, right? A little lock over here. It runs the um, communication encryption uh, infrastructure for the world, basically, OpenSSL. There's a few alternatives, but um, uh, OpenSSL is the big one. And so what they, they found a vulnerability inside it that if you, with a specially crafted message, the, open S the, the server running OpenSSL would give you a, uh, a portion of its memory uh, just like random portion of its memory, I think. And so uh, that's for, applic for application servers, that's really bad um, because the memory contains all things like the session keys. So you can do session hijacking. It contains things like, uh, you know, if people are logging in and using passwords and that kind of thing, it contains things like passwords. It contains things um, like passwords to your backend database. It contains you know all the email addresses and so on right so it's it's like it's, uh, a terrible thing to have happened uh I, okay so there's actually a, a canadian connection um i think was it this one yeah okay uh the canada revenue agency had to shut down its services um when they realized that they would be that heartbleed was being ex actively exploited and uh, approximately 900 social insurance numbers were stolen um and so uh this was where was the date uh i thought i saw a date here last do you guys see a date when i read this earlier nope i don't see a date Citation. Yeah, maybe. Oh yeah, 9th of April. Okay, 9th of April, right? So uh, yeah, 9th of April, 2014. Okay. Yeah. So uh, released, date discovered. Okay, okay, good. Um, so the, the, okay, it was released in 2012. It was discovered in, in 2014. Sorry, I, I, I got the, the Open SSL. The version was released in 2012. But anyway, um, it was nine. It was eight days after, oh, and two days after the patch that the CRA got attacked. So it happens extremely quickly, right? Especially for something like this that is like network uh, network exposed and, and sort of famous. So that's heartbeat. That was one. Um, another one that caused severe panic everywhere was Meltdown and Spectre. You guys know about Meltdown or Spectre? I remember that one. 
So this is the one you probably it probably it's going to going to sound familiar soon. I hope maybe. Um, so this is the this is a side channel attack. So side channels attacks are where you don't where you use like um, environmental um, uh, uh, like things around the process in order to find out what a process is doing. So for example um the there's some uh side channel, side channel attacks that will listen to the in just in research no exploited ones but that will like listen to the hard drive noises the noises that the hard drive will make and then extract data based on the noises the hard drives are making um but uh this side channel attack is basically uh used to expose a cpu cache so you run a process to go and get whatever's in the CPU cache and get it. Um, uh, uh, you can take a look at it as well. But I remember there was this was a big panic uh, back when when was this 2018? So this was uh, five years ago. It was a panic in at least with the security administrators I was talking to, and everyone had to go and update um, their operating systems. Uh, to do software um, software mitigations against it. Uh, the problem with Spectre and Meltdown, though, is that it's a hardware <laughs> vulnerability, and so and the software mitigations, while pretty effective, uh, were you know, hurt performance. And so, you, but sometimes it just you have to take the hit. Uh, they do have, they do release, um, uh, the operating systems have gotten better, but they're also releasing like a resilient um, uh, CPUs to, to that kind of attack. It's not, it's not like, uh, it's not fixed, Joe. Um, it's still something that could, could be, happen. It's just harder to exploit now. Um, and then there's Log4Shell. So Log4Shell happened two years ago. This is the one that ruined Christmas for me. Um, date patch, 6th of December. Um, so the, uh, I, I, it feels like it was later than that. Oh, I think there were multiple patches that came out. Um, but log for shell was, if you managed to get a specially crafted message into the logs, log, log4j, by the way, sorry, is an app, is a, is a Java library for logging. Um, Logging being like if your application's running, you log things so that your administrators can know what's going on. Um, and so uh, log4j had this vulnerability. Log4shell was if you could get a specially crafted message into the log, you could do things like send information outbound from the server. And so like the <laughs> security researchers on Twitter and that kind of thing, um, you know, did things like, Put the vulnerable like the special log uh, inside their email at the, at the, in the signatures of the emails uh, because if that ever happened to spill into a log somewhere it would go to their servers um, so anyway the um, uh, that was it so this one was like a big uh, uh, a big um, um, yeah the single most biggest most critical vulnerability ever i guess uh arguably the most severe vulnerability ever uh, because it, it lets you actually like execute um uh code on remote servers by just getting them to log things anyway so uh that was log for shell that was that was a, another big panic so they happen every now and again they don't happen I, they wouldn't say they happen frequently, but they, um, they're not uncommon. Every couple of years, there'll be one where everybody has to drop everything and, uh, and fix them. What's interesting about them is that they never really, there's so much old infrastructure in the world that I'm sure there's some, you know, servers that are still hardly exposed. Um, at least I know there's, at the very least, the people's, um, uh, the, yeah. So they might might not even know it. Those what mitigates those issues hopefully is that uh, if those servers are ignored, then hopefully they're unimportant. Um, good. All right. So that's what I have. That's what I have for today. Thanks for thanks for coming. Awesome. Thanks. Good.